Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this installment of Boyce Thompson Institute's Breaking Ground Discussion Series. My name is AJ Bushy. I'm in the Communications Department here at BTI. And for this month's Breaking Ground, we are welcomed by, uh, we welcome Surya Saha, a senior bioinformatics analyst here at BTI in Lucas Mueller's lab, who specializes in developing databases and large scale analysis for understanding complex biological data for agricultural crops. And today we're gonna to talk about his work on citrus graining disease, um, which is currently devastating the US um, citrus industry with a focus on, specifically on his focus on helping uh, undergrads from multiple institutions um, getting involved in this type of research. So hi, Surya, welcome here. I am really happy to be here, first of all. Thank you, AJ and to the rest of the team for giving me this opportunity to talk. Uh, and uh, for all of you who are attending right now, and hopefully we'll have more people who show up. So the, I just want to quickly take a few minutes to give you my background. Um, so I started off in India with my uh, program in computer science. And when I came to the US, uh, it was a small school. You can see my pointer, I think. Um, it was a small school in, in Mississippi. Uh, it was an HBCU where I was just doing a computer science master's degree. And I started working in a wet lab. And that's where I started getting interested a little bit into biology. And uh, from, from then on, basically it's been a journey. It's been a serendipitous journey where um, I had no plans to do a PhD. But as I started getting into more of biology, I really got, uh, got interested. And so, so what attracted you to plant biology in particular, I mean, as a computer scientist, um, you know, how did you get from, from one point A to point B, I guess? Right, and at that point, I didn't even know point B. I just knew that I wanted to uh, move away from point A, which was standard computer science. So as I was working in a, in a wet lab, doing PCRs, uh, running Lycor gels, AFLPs, I really saw this need of data analysis, but with life science data not with, let's say, banking transactions or customer data. And, and uh, th there was this niche which was not really being filled. And you, you all have to keep in mind, AJ knows, but for audience, back 15, 20 years ago, the field of computational biology and mathematics was still very nascent. People had heard of things like the human genome, but genomics or, for example, we are all dealing with COVID and how sequencing each strain makes a difference to vaccine development those concepts were, didn't really translate into common knowledge. So back then we didn't have well-established bioinformatics programs too. So since I, it, I got interested in biology and I decided that I don't want to do another master's, PhD was the next step, uh, fine, then let's find a PhD program. So I was already working with somebody at, at Mississippi State and they were very happy to have me in their lab. Now then the question was, okay, that's a plant science department. So do I do a PhD in agronomy? Uh, that would have been slightly complicated coming from a computer science background. So then it was interest, it was fascinating. There was a lot of back and forth between the, the heads of department of plant science and computer science, where I was a student in computer science department, but I was sitting in the plant science department and they really had to work out a lot of new administrative things. And there is a little anecdote here. I am doing some name dropping, but uh, so they were just, going back and forth. And uh, back then, after the Human Genome Project, uh, Craig Winter came to town, somebody on campus knew. And if you don't know Craig Winter, he was uh, synonymous with the Human Genome Sequencing Project way back then. Yeah. So uh, my <laughs> two advisors went out to dinner with him along with a large group of people. And they, they, they made the case that there is a student who comes from a computer science background, is interested, in biology, what degree should he do? And Craig Venter was able to convince them that he should do a degree in computer science, the student, not he, the student should do a degree in computer science, but sit in the wet lab. And that's exactly what happened. And I'm grateful for the journey since then, um, coming on, well, after I finished my PhD, uh, coming over to Cornell uh, in the plant pathology department, doing a postdoc over there, then to BTI and, We'll, we'll talk more about that, but that's been yeah. the journey. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. So you were really right at the beginning of, of, of the, the plant bioinformatics down in Mississippi State. 
literally the first one. That's cool. Um, are there other things that, that you enjoy before we move into uh, some of the more sciencey things that you'd like to share with share with us all? Sure. Um, I basically put this slide together to emphasize that people know scientists and people uh, and scientists spend a lot of time in the lab or at their computer. Let's say people who do mathematics, but there's a whole world outside which uh, I really appreciate uh, and. Let's see if the slide transitions. It does, amazing. Right, so we live in Ithaca. Ithaca is a beautiful place. It's cold today, so you may not appreciate that, but uh, there are amazing things you can do here. I got involved with the Dragon Boat community. We were just in, in Puerto Rico three weeks ago competing wow. there. That, that was fun because going from 30 degrees to 85 degrees and competing <laughs> was challenging for an unfit individual such as myself. Um, but yeah, that's been a, be a beautiful part of living here, uh, canoeing, uh, outrigger canoeing. And then I spend a lot of time with my dogs. We have such beautiful hiking trails around. Uh, it's, it's, I think we are all very lucky that we get to live in a place like Ithaca. So I just wanted to share this part of my life. Yeah, those are cute dogs. Thanks. They know I didn't it. realize that the, just, just a quick aside, I didn't realize the Dragon Boat um, folks, I didn't know you traveled that far away for the, I like, I know the, the big dragon boat race down on Cayuga Lake. I didn't realize it was a thing all over the place. Yeah, uh, it's a, yeah, it's a worldwide sport and um, it's got a large following here in North America. If you go to Canada, it's got an even larger following and you would think why so it's just, it's grown. And yeah. um, it's, it's really easy to travel because basically you're just tra traveling as a team and the local organizers, organize the boats and everything. So actually you don't have to carry equipment that really Thanks. simplifies travel. Very neat. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about citrus greening disease um, since that's what your, or one of your folks is, is these days. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that and how you got involved with that research? Sure. So let's take a step back on uh, about the disease. I know AJ mentioned a few facts about it. But basically in this system, it's a trifecta. So we have a bacteria, which is unculturable. Uh, that's really important because you cannot grow it in the lab. So the only way, well, the, there, are, uh, there has been some progress, but I'm going to paint broad strokes here. So basically this is a bacteria which is not culturable. You can only st study it in the insect, which is carrying it, transmitting it, and in citrus, which is the host. And uh, Canadatus libribacter asiaticus, it's a mouthful. So we also call it c uh, That is being transmitted by diaphragma citri, or also called Asian citrus psyllid. I may say ACP, which is basically an abbreviation for that. So you have got these three players. And this infects pretty much every kind of citrus, lemon, just whatever you can think of. And uh, up here on the right, I have this little, little uh, snippet from a newspaper headline, I think this was back in 2017, where because of HLB infection in the state of Florida, today it's in every single county. It's a, it's a given that it is in your growth. It's a question of how many trees have it. Uh, that Florida fell behind California in citrus production. That if you had told this statistic, this fact to somebody 10, 15 years ago, they would have laughed you off. But this has completely changed the dynamic of citrus, citrus industry worldwide, but also for us. Uh, so it show, showed up in the US around um, approximately around 2004, 2005. And since then, it has devastated production all over. And uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. And if people have more questions, we can always go there at the end. So how did you get involved with this in your, in your journey from computer science to, to bioinformatics, plant science? That is a great question. So how did a lab, Munich lab, located here in upstate New York, get involved in a disease which is not in New York State, essentially? It is in Florida, Texas, California. So the lab, I'm just going to take a quick second here. The, the lab st started off with the Tomato Genome Project, building SGN, for the Solanaceae community. Since then, we have the lab has built 
similar databases and toolkits for cassava, a whole bunch of um, Africa-focused Gates Foundation projects. Citrus greening also happened under this umbrella. So I actually started working on citrusgreening.org, the website, and on this disease back in 2009 when I joined Magdalen Lindbergh, um, who was in Alan Comer's group in plant pathology. So at that point, it was our first grant from CRDF, and we were trying to build a web resource for a relatively new disease. And since then, we have really grown, and we the lab uses open, open source tools. It's very transparent. All the code is on GitHub. So this was the way the, the Mueller lab got hooked into the citrus greening research ecosystem. So it kind of made sense, right? Because they they do they have similar databases, genomic databases for other for other uh, plant species. I guess you could say. Yep. Okay. So, um, what what is the the project, the specific project of uh, citrusgreening.org, or or what 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 is happening now since that database has been created? Great point. So uh, we have come a long way. The I started working in 2009, moved over to Boyce Thompson part-time in 2013 on the Tomato Genome Project. Then 2015, we got this grant, which was a USD and NIFA project. And um, this was a five-year CAPS project. And right now we are in phase two of it. So we will talk about phase two if there is time, but let me focus on phase one. Mm -hmm. So in phase one, um, as I describe it up here, we have essentially the Mueller lab was responsible for this huge component on the, on the left of your screen, if you can see my pointer. So mm -hmm. we were doing all the data integration uh, and interactome studies. So all of that went into citrus green. And so the goal was just in a nutshell to figure out to generate genomics, transcriptomics data, find candidate genes of interest, um, mostly in the insect. And I'll explain why. Because, so it is citrus greening, it is affecting citrus, but because uh, we cannot, we don't want to modify citrus and, and make any changes on that end, if we can disrupt the transmission of the bacteria from citrus tree to citrus tree, which happens with this insect, Asian citrus psyllid, that would be, that, that is the path we chose. So then the entire focus was on cellular genome sequencing, trying to find candidate genes for disruption using methods like RNAi. Now we have CRISPR, there is another method, RNA aptamer, which, which Annie worked on in Michelle's lab. So we had a whole bunch of assays to impact genes in the cellular genome, but the goal was to put, bring all that data together. So was, was, was this driven by a lot of the, the anti-GMO sentiment? You didn't want to have to fiddle with the oranges or lemons or whatever? You, it's you, In the end, there is a question of the anti-GMO sentiment, uh, sentiment. Then the real question is regulation. You can, mm -hmm. you can develop a fantastic solution in the lab, but unless you can take it to the field, yeah. it's not very useful. So the whole idea was if we were able, if we were to discover and maybe we'll have time to talk about this, uh, some solutions, if you want to take it to the field, then it would be much easier to impact the psyllid, the insect, rather than citrus. That makes sense. So, um, so we've talked a bit about, uh, you know, the undergrads and some of the people involved. Um, could you tell us a bit more about that? Yes. Okay. So, right, first of all, there, this, this, like all projects in the Munich Lab, is highly collaborative. It's a big consortium of groups, uh, which includes universities, uh, nonprofit research institutions, uh, USDA labs. Uh, so, this is an old photograph way before COVID, but <laughs> at that point, we had a lot of people, we had a lot of summer interns. Summer interns are a wonderful part of life at, at BTI. So they also contributed to citrus greening. Uh, so, so overall, we had uh, some, some of our team members in the Muno lab dedicated to the project. Mirella, Prashant, Chang Chen, and Stephanie were both students. 
the they are all co-authors on different citrus greening publications I, um, and we'll talk about those things later some of the resources we built like pathway da databases for citrus was a collaboration with the Dory Mains lab at Washington State University who maintains citrus genome DB. That's also a good point. Then we develop resources for a community. The goal is also not to step on anybody's toes, to respect the entire, all the players who some of them have been there before us. So, and that make, and doing that with software is actually in some ways quite easy. If you develop the right connections, you can develop tools on both the sites and they can talk to each other. Um, and that's what we were able to do with Citrus Genome DB and Citrus Greening .org, And I'm very happy about that. So all um, a bunch of main lab members are co-authors on Citrus Greening .org publication. That's nice to hear. I think it'd be a nice collaborative effort. Yes, and uh, maybe uh, just to step back for a second and talk about how this students got involved because that, that was the real question. So when we are working on this left end of the spectrum, we are looking at all these interactome studies, we are looking at gene targets in the psyllid, we knew due to the limitations of sequencing technology and genome assembly, we don't have time to go into all of that, that there were errors in the genome, there were sequencing errors. And if we want the correct gene model that can be targeted using RNAi or CRISPR or aptamers, we needed well-characterized sequences for those genes. And this was a nice fit for outreach where we had students at Indian River State College, which is a state college in uh, Fort Pierce, of a, a region directly impacted by citrus greening. Where our US, yeah, uh, where our USDA co co collaborators had strong connections. So we were also looking for student projects and that uh, turned out to be a beautiful match where students could be trained and assigned gene families, which they studied in other insects and they annotated using mm -hmm. web tools. So all of this was virtual. We were doing virtual even before COVID happened. So this entire setup, uh, which was run by resources, the web resources were based here at, in Boyce Thompson um, in the basement, in our server room, and uh, the students in Florida and Kansas State and University of Cincinnati um, and Cornell, they were all, all using those resources. So that's how the students got um, pulled into this, this project. That's great. So you're kind of, are they mostly also computer scientists the way you were or are there some plant scientists like are you are you doing kind of what you did pulling pulling more computer science people into plant science so the um tom delia who was a professor at irsc he mm -hmm. um, he had an intro to bio course so these were all essentially students who were gotcha. who were passed out in his cohort essentially so they had they had uh, bio 101 sort of background so they knew gene structure um, DNA and RNA basic biology, but to take that from textbook and actually show them real messy biological data and trying to do something useful was was a was a journey for them too. Yeah, that's great. So, uh, can we talk a little bit more about this program? Because it sounds it sounds really cool. Um, you know, getting getting the undergraduates into this kind of work early. I mean, it sounds pretty advanced to me. <laughs> it it was, and that that was the big transition. Then we we as in uh, the team is full of researchers and scientists, and we are communicating and trying to solve a particular problem. And then we are trying to bring students into the fold. That is a whole different methodology uh, yeah. to to use. And we we learned along the way, and we published what we learned along the way too. So just to quickly go over some of the things that were a part of the. Um, data ecosystem that we developed. And uh, then I'll, I'll talk more about genome assembly and annotation. So again, these were the three players, right? We have Diaphragna citri, Asian citrus psyllid, the bacteria, CLAS, and citrus. So the focus was on genome assembly and gene annotation in Diaphragna citri. Uh, but we developed a resource. So the whole idea of citrus greening was not, oh yes, let's develop resources for one genome. Now we are trying to develop resources for a disease system. So data for um, the microbiome of the cell. 
data for the bacteria. All of that, we tried to put all of that into one system. And it's a process. Uh, mm -hmm. We were successful to a certain extent, but at least we it was all under one roof. And we have continued the integration journey since then. Um, what kind of work did we do at that point? We had pathway databases, which are essentially, when we talk about genes, they are working in the context of pathways, which are producing metabolites. Ultimately, what you see in the phenotype is a result of something happening at the molecular level. So pathways is where all, all of that starts. Then we had expression atlas, uh, which was basically taking RNA-seq data, transcriptomics data for mm -hmm. many different conditions for all the genes and trying to st study what's, what's happening. So if you think of it, when a student is working on one gene, they can go to this expression atlas, look at how this gene is behaving in many different conditions uh, under different disease states in different tissues. And then they can literally paint a picture of what's happening as the disease is progressing in the host. So uh, we built all of that. And then we started off with manual annotation. I love that way of thinking about it. It's a disease system. It's like everything to do with that disease. It's not just one little piece of it. That's a... Just a, a, a quick side question, or, or maybe too early for this, but are is this kind of thing being done with other ag diseases? Or is this, I've never heard of anything quite like this. That's a great point. So it's being done with diseases in the biomedical world because yes, yes that's that's been done. But on the agricultural front, no. Citrus mm -hmm. greening essentially became for USD, has become, uh, a grand challenge. So, because this is almost a model invasive disease system, which did not exist in the US at all uh, about two decades ago. And out then, of right, out of nowhere. So, this is a great, I don't want to keep on harping about COVID as an example, but it's, it's an example of a disease that you don't deal with at all. There is no history. The growers don't know about it because they have never seen it in their groves. And all of a sudden, in, in a few years, every single county in your primary citrus growing state is infected. So the entire process of studying invasive diseases, developing funding mechanisms to study it, involving the right agencies, involving industry growers, this is a model invasive disease system. So when something like this happens again, the agencies know, and also the private partners and growers know, this is the checklist. This is the process to follow to deal with the new disease system. So that's that's what citrus screening has become. So uh, can we talk a little bit about um, what this program has accomplished? I know you, you mentioned that you know publishing papers and things. Right, and it has accomplished a lot. Uh, but today's talk is focused on undergraduate outreach and mm -hmm. and publications. So I'll just talk about that part. So, but, but if you want to know what this project has done, please talk to me or go to citrusgreening.org. Um, this has come a long way. Uh, and maybe we'll have time to talk about it towards the end. So what we did with the students was we started off virtual collaboration. So this, this is me here in Florida uh, in, in their, their Zoom conference room where I, I, I used to be just on the screen. I am Prashant and Mirella and Lucas from, from time to time. And we were we were coordinating, so we built an ecosystem of resources for this virtual co virtual collaboration using basically all free tools. Almost you only had one paid subscription. So we we created this project, and they were being this project was being locally managed at Kansas State, at University of Cincinnati, and at IRSC by local professors and postdocs and scientists. But then we had this overarching uh, umbrella running out of BTI, out of the, the Mueller lab, which was managing the, the entire project. And as we started developing correct protocols and methods, we just we became better at it. Uh, it was a learning process for us too. Um, how to recruit annotators, that, that was a big thing. How do you get students interested in something which they have never done, very few of their friends have done. So just to do that sort of outreach to incoming freshmen to, to show them that, hey, if you get involved, then in a few months, we have these publications coming out and 
we were very, very focused on getting students, undergraduate students as first authors, not just in the middle. And, and maybe we'll get a chance to talk about that towards the end. So yeah, that's great. To recruit them, build teams, make them work together, peer mentoring. It's, in our experience, it really worked well when they work with each other rather than being instructed. And we, we, we always wanted a very flat management model. So students were peer mentoring, helping new students come in, the next cohort come in, uh, and also recruit. I mean, they, they were the best recruiters in a way because they knew the whole experience. Yeah. How, how was that? Like kind of mentoring the mentors? Did you have that kind of program, like mentoring the, the upper class students? Yes, it grew very organically. So essentially, uh, we, as I said, we developed our protocols over time. And, it, and in the end, we had a very uh, good system, which we, which we even went out and published. Um, here is a quick 10 rule sort of paper where uh, um, we, we talk about what you need to do to set up a system, how to, um, what sort of um, software will you need, how to get the students, how to train the students, how to train the mentors. So we figured things out along the way. And as you can imagine, right, when you start off a new project, there is really no documentation. As you start writing out your standard operating procedures, they become, and you, you test it with different cohorts of students, it becomes better and more formal, uh, deals with more use cases. And that's exactly what happened and what got published. Mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe just a small point. The pu publication on the bottom was during COVID where there was a special issue in JMB where they were looking for suggestions how to take an existing cohort of undergraduate students and move that class from in-classroom to virtual. And this, we presented this as a solution that, okay, even in the middle of the semester, once the students have some background, you can quickly transition with very little overhead uh, to an online platform. So if, did I hear you right? You said you want to get the students in uh, early and then they could be an author on a paper in only a couple of months. How was that? How's that possible it, to be that fast? It was not possible in the very beginning because we were still figuring out our processes. But towards the end, then, I mean, we, what has typically happened is students who got involved with us, with our project during their course, they got so interested that they wanted to continue it as an independent research project mm -hmm. or a capstone project. So that's how uh, we have longer associations. But even students who got involved and so let's say we have got one gene report or a pathway report, which has got eight student authors. Some of the students only worked on it for a few weeks, but they contributed. And our goal was to recognize every single person who has contributed and, yeah, and moved great. on because that, 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 that was the goal. Yeah. So are these students, are they identifying genes? Are they doing like wet lab work in addition to see what, what these genes do? Or what it's, exactly are they doing here? Great, great question. Uh, it's a mix of the two. So most of the students are at the first level where they are doing mathematics and looking at gene function at the sequence level. They're looking at other hemipteran insects. If those genes have been annotated, what is the gene structure there? So doing all of that computationally. Some of the students uh, were in, involved in pro projects which were a uh, collaboration with Wayne Hunter, um, who was a USDA collaborator in Fort Pierce where they were going to his lab and running assays on those genes, which they had annotated. So they really saw the full cycle of it. Mm. It's not the theory that, okay, this gene maybe does this, uh, but then they can go into the lab, do, do an RNA experiment and see if they disrupt it, what happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, we're getting, getting it's about 12.33. Um, if folks have any questions, for Surya, you can pop them in the little chat box. Um, and I guess I'll ask one more. Um, how have you seen, how have you seen the, the, the undergraduate students themselves grow in, in mature, if, if that's the right word? Um, have you seen, have you seen this program benefit not just the science and, and you know, the data curation, but, but also them? Absolutely. 
Um, there are lots of anecdotal stories, but if I was to find a common thread, it's essentially that a lot of students got interested in, in, in science essentially as a career. So some of them went to grad school. Um, there, are, there are too many names to mention, so I don't want to uh, get, get started on that, but they are just, it, this was very um, rewarding to see that these students got involved at a very, very early stage of their undergraduate education in doing actual research. They liked the interaction that they had with scientists. They liked the intellectual benefits that they got out of it. And they got inspired to go to grad school, uh, pursue careers in science. So um, I mean, not all of them went to grad school, but they, they, they went into scientific careers in industry or in government jobs. So we saw this direct pipeline. So if I mm -hmm. was to, uh, throw out some numbers, uh, basically, if, if I was to count the total number of students at each institution that got that was involved, it's a pretty large number, more than 50 students at IRSC, uh, were 30 odd students at uh, University of Cincinnati, Kansas around 10, Cornell about four. So all of well, Cornell students were uh, probably on the path for doing undergraduate, I mean, graduate work anyways, but a lot of the students who were at IRSC and possibly at other institutions who were not in thinking of graduate school. This was, and, and research, it's not just graduate school, but research. They got mm -hmm. interested in research, working with complicated questions where you don't know the answer. You, you are uh, moving around in the dark, uh, but working with helpful colleagues, you're working in a, in a system that fosters inquisitiveness and supports you. They like that environment and that got them interested in research and we are very proud of that that's fantastic that's good to hear i mean that's that's such a bigger goal than just focusing on the one one disease i mean it's such a screening disease is really important but getting more getting more um young folks involved in the field of plant science research i think is so important so that's good to hear so thank you for doing that <laughs> And all and all of your um, you know colleagues. I know there are some there are some watching today. Um, so I guess uh, that that leads me to I guess my last question, which is um, and again, if anybody has questions out there, feel free to put them in the chat the chat box. Um, you mentioned this is only one goal of of this project, the citrus greening disease or uh, project or citrusgreening.org. Um, what else, What are some of the other things that, that you're working on other than this, this um, kind of training project? Right, so as I mentioned earlier that this was from phase one of the citrus green project mm. where we were focused not on citrus, but on the psyllid, the insect that transmits the bacteria. So since, but the goal of that project was to develop solutions. So one of, one of the um, ideas that came out of it were uh, citrus related immunity peptides. So then that, that became phase two of the project, which is going on right now. So if you think about it, in phase one, we generated, we were working in basic biology, generated a lot of omics data, generated candidate genes and therapies. In phase two of the project, we are taking, we are now taking one of those solutions and different labs are doing uh, different parts of it. So I'm, I'm just talking about a, one part which the Mural Lab is involved in. Uh, so these citrus immunity peptides, now we are trying to take them through the regulate, through regulation, doing trials in Texas, Florida, uh, then dealing with EPA, the regulatory affairs, and then trying to take them to essentially be mass produced as a product. So, that's what's happening right now. Um, and, and we can go there if, if we have more time. So what, yeah, I guess, so what is the product? Can you say what this product is or? Yeah, these are, uh, so the, there are a set of citrus pep peptides which have been shown to increase immunity to c labs. I see. And we are, the project is testing it in citrus, in various, in field trials, in the greenhouse, and it's being tased, 
tested on citrus as well as the psyllid to see if it can knock down infection. So there are many details to it, which I'm oversimplifying. <laughs> so if you have to apply something in the field, whether it's a spray, whether it's a foliar spray, yeah. whether, whether it's, a, it's a ground spray targeting right. the roots, there are many different pieces to it. Right. And then the other thing to keep in mind is, uh, and maybe this is relevant to people who are concerned about uh, impact to the environment, anything that, we, that uh, is being applied, you want to make sure that you are not impacting the plant negatively. You are not impacting the beneficial insects or microbes negatively. So right. all of that goes into the picture. That's very important. Um, this kind of leads into a question from Alan Renwick. Is the ultimate goal to alter the insects so that they cannot transmit the bacteria? Is that a goal? Or that was the primary goal of phase one of the project where uh, if we can do multiple things, we can re uh, re reduce the fecundity, we can reduce the reproduction re rate, we can increase the mortality, we can kill the insect. Um, and if, if we can just disrupt the communication, the interdependency between C. Lass and the insect so that it doesn't transmit the bacteria. Uh, there are a couple comments. Two research groups have successfully shown CRISPR edits in the Asian citrus psyllid and suppression of endosymbiont proftella, if I'm pronouncing that right, and the blood also reduce the last transmission. Yeah, yeah, that's the, well, right. Um, and that's from Wayne, uh, who's, who's a collaborator on the citrus greening project. Um, and, and he's an entomologist. He's a research entomologist with USDA. Uh, and, and yeah, a lot of people are working on citrus greening. Maybe we don't realize it sitting up here in upstate New York, but if you're in the state of Florida, in a plant pathology department, basically, Every second lab is somehow associated with citrus screening. Yeah. Yeah. So, did these come out of this particular project, or are these additional? These, um, are... these are uh, some of these are generated by project members, but I, it, yes and no. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> we are affiliated, but I, I don't think the project can directly claim uh, the to do this work. So we've talked project. a little about, about regulations and things. I, I thought it was interesting, you, um, you know, we are in upstate New York. You know, this is not an endemic disease for us. It, does that have, um, it, you know, what, what, why, why up here? Why are we doing stuff up here? Is there a reason? That's, uh, besides, so the mural lab, I gave uh, some, some background on how we are involved in data integration and databases. But in, in, in the real world, where, where you have to maintain these insects, grow their colonies, do these experiments. So doing that in uh, certain places is highly regulated. Moving insects across state lines, um, living is very complicated. Even sending DNA samples has been complicated and DNA and RNA samples has been complicated. So wherever this disease is present, the regulation is highly controlled and you, it completely makes sense. They are trying yeah. to tamp, cram down the disease. So they have very strict rules, uh, which makes it very difficult to work with it. If researcher A in, in university one wants to work with something uh, or wants to validate something that, uh, that researcher B has done, but they cannot get their hands on the samples they have to physically go to this other institution and do it. It really makes things complicated. So, yeah. and, um, and, and all of this work in BTI was done in Michelle Hex lab. Uh, so that's how uh, it has been. Uh, I mean, we got, they, they got the insects from Bob Shatter's lab um, and other labs down in Florida. Um, and to grow them here was less uh, administratively cumbersome. Let me put it this way. That makes sense. If, if they escape here somehow, they're not going to destroy somebody's citrus field because <laughs> there aren't any citrus fields. Right? Exactly. And they would not be able to overwinter. So yeah. <laughs> it, it really cuts. And their, their life cycle is really short, less than a month. So right. even if we had some escapees, uh, <laughs> they wouldn't be able to propagate too much. Um, what next step would you like to happen if you could go in any direction? That's a good question. That is a great question. That's like a blue sky sort of question. So 
Yep. There are many things that are happening in, in the world of citrus greening. I have just touched, I've, I've barely scratched the surface. But as far as our lab and our group is concerned, if I just take that little myopic view, um, we are, so with the citrus peptides that um, research we are involved in, that if that goes um, through the re regulatory affairs, and, and there are many other solutions at various stages of regulation. Let me just make a clear point, which we are not involved in, but in the field of citrus greening, there are many such solutions at different levels. There are, there, are, there are solutions to bolster the health of citrus. Uh, without going into de details, one of the methods that grows discovered, if you cannot cure citrus greening, what else can you do? Can you prolong the life, the productivity of your citrus trees? So by, by giving them nutrients, by, by, or if, if you can actually encapsulate them in the field, where it was almost, if you think of a greenhouse in the field, where they they have yes. citrus under protective coverage. So yeah. many different methods have been tried to prolong the productivity of the trees, and there are there are uh, partial successes. But the thing is, doing any of those at scale has always escaped us. And yes. so there are many parallel solutions continuing. Uh, okay, just and just to go back to the question, uh, we. The goal is to have some of these solutions go into the growers' hands so that they can be tried and tested in the field. And, uh, and then we can save citrus industry, at least parts of it. A lot of it is already gone. And maybe people, the listeners don't, uh, I don't know if they are directly connected to farmers, but there are many families who have been growing this for generations who have had to close shop completely. Yeah or move away from citrus entirely because it was just not sustainable. Yeah, some of the pictures of the, like the groves, some of the groves down in Florida that are just completely destroyed. It's pretty, pretty sad to see. Yeah. Um, here's another one. Uh, how, how can you increase the use of data in agri-vectors? I'm not sure what agri-vectors is. So maybe you could tell us if you know what that is. Yeah, so that is another project in the Mural Lab where the goal was, actually this, this goes back to the question that, that, that you asked AJ, that are these sorts of databases common for agricultural problems? Mm -hmm. And I said they are not. But, but AgriVectors is, a, is one step in that direction where can we look at other disease systems um, like, and so potato psyllid, also, also vectors a similar disease. And uh, that has been a parallel model system for studying citrus greening. So, uh, so, so there are other disease systems which are transmitted by insects and they haven't had a home yet, really. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll correct myself, on the, on the biomedical side, yes. So if you're looking at malaria, if you're, if you're looking at other diseases that are transmitted by uh, Zika, uh, so th those have been studied and there are many resources, but there are uh, no such parallel resources for agricultural disease, syst disease systems that are propagated and transmitted by insects. So agrivectors is a step in that direction where we are starting with some related diseases to citrus greening, and then hopefully that will grow into something bigger. So what exactly is agrivectors? Is it another it's, database? Or? It's another database, exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. I should have just, just maybe said that. Okay, so um, I guess to get kind of back to, to Alan's question, um, and you mentioned other, you know, diseases, biomedical things, you know, there, uh, there are these genetically modified mosquitoes being released to try to kind of knock down, you know, malaria and West Nile virus and things like that. Is that um, a potential, like, to, to genetically modify the psyllids and release them en masse? Is that something that's... So yes and no, uh, and and maybe the, the best answer is it depends. It depends on how much how much time and money there is, because there are lots of solutions, but are they scalable? So you can um, show a huge impact in the lab, uh, but to release them at scale, so that there is a drive in the population, which where your modified insect takes over the wild population. That is um, 
pretty difficult to do administratively and financially. So yes, it's possible. Uh, can that be done feasibly is, is, is the question. And in time to save citrus, because by the time you achieve that level of control, maybe everything is already infected. So you just have, yeah. So the, 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 there are many real world factors which can get, get in the way, but yes, that is something which um, has been has been worked on and is being worked on. Very cool. Um, if uh, there are any other questions, please put them in the chat box. So far, uh, we've, we've asked them all. It's good, pretty good use of time. Is there anything else you would like to share, Surya, that we may have missed, we haven't talked about? Yeah, I would like to circle back to the students um, because they have been a very enjoyable part of uh, this work. And they, they have been the whole reason why we have done it. Um, and, and we have discovered many, many uh, great things along the way. So with, with the students, it's been, uh, it's been eye-opening how we started off with a haphazard mix of Google Docs and steps. And we gave it to them and said that, okay, um, this is what we want to do. Can you guys talk amongst yourself and figure out how uh, you know the next steps would be? And what has been very rewarding is to see how they have grown themselves. So they have students. We had, of course, we had faculty involved and, and postdocs, but the students have been peer mentors. So they have written up most of the documentation we use today. Mm. They have written up the standard operating procedures. And not just that, uh, they, they have done the really hard work. They have done paired annotation where they're sitting with a new student who has absolutely no idea. They are, they are, the student has probably never seen a genome sequence in all its messiness and all messy, complicated scientific data. And I won't go into details, but it's just, it's very different to step away from a, stick, from a textbook with a classical model, which you study and answer a few questions on, and then look at a, a DNA sequence that has been assembled which has errors, you have got RNA-seq data mapping to it, you're trying to figure out where the gene starts, where it ends, uh, how to decide whether this is correct or not, and where experience comes into play, where uh, when you start, just like all of us, when we start something new, um, we are not very confident. We are not we, to make those judgment calls, but with experience, these students, they, they all discovered that research is making is making the best judgment call at that point, given the evidence you have. I mean, that in a nutshell is, is what, what we do in research. Given the knowledge we have today, we make the best judgment and then we revise it tomorrow because that's how science yeah. develops. So, so that, that process, the scientific process was, um, was in play in, in different microcosms. So the, uh, that was really, really good to see. And, yeah, from and, and we had many students who stepped up to leadership positions. Again, not taking names. Uh, you know who you are if you're in the audience. Um, but they were they were great in in leading their friends um, and colleagues through this through this path. Yeah, I'm. I'm it looked like there were about a hundred students in this so far as well. Yeah, like that's. Yeah, this is like seven years down the line. So yeah. that's. That's great. That's that's really nice to hear. Okay, I think I think that's it. We're we're running it out of time. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Surya Saha, for uh, taking the time to chat with us, and thank you everyone out there in Zoom world uh, for joining us today. And I would like to invite you to please join us for BTI's next breaking ground discussion series, Wednesday, May twenty fifth, with Dr. Gary Bossard who studies the biology and pathology of viral infections and interactions in insect cells. So little, little um, overlap with what we're talking about today, perhaps. It should be, it'll be a really good one, so I hope you join us. And you can go to btiscience.org to register, and I'm gonna pop some URLs in the chat to everybody. So you can go to that top one to register. And uh, you can read more about BTI's current research and many other neat stories about BTI science in our annual report. 
which you can find online at btiscience.org slash annual report. And uh, BTI is an independent nonprofit research institute, and we operate in large part thanks to the generosity of community members like you all out there. And if you'd like to make a gift to support BTI, you can donate online at btiscience.org slash give or email our development team at development at btiscience.org. So I want to thank everyone again for your interest and your support of Boyce Thompson Institute and have a wonderful day and be well. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Thank you all. Uh, sir, yeah.